Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, a very warm welcome to all the devotees to our Srimad Bhagavatam study class. In today's class, we will continue our discussion on the 8th chapter of the first canto from verse number 43 and conclude the chapter today, which is still verse number 52. And then we will uh, further continue uh, to the ninth chapter. And most likely we plan to finish the first 14 verses of the ninth chapter today. So overall, this is our 24th class. The title of this chapter is Prayers by Queen Kunti and Parikshit Maharaj Saved. And the title of the next ninth chapter is uh, uh, Passing of Lord Bhishma Dev. So we will cover that in a short while. Let us start with the prayers. And for prayers, Rakesh ji, who is the devotee today? Vidya Mata. Vidya Mata ji. Vidya Mata yes, ji, Prabhuji. please. Please. Yes, yeah. Should I start? Prabhuji? Yes, yes. Please, please, Mataji. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Om Agyan Timrandasya Gyanan Janashala Kya Jakshran Miltam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Nama Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Swam Rupa Kadamayam Tathati Swapadantikam one day, Ham Shri Guru, Shri Yutapadukamalam, Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha, Shri Rupam Sagradatam, Sagan Ragunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam, Sadvetam Savadutam, Prajan Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padan Saha. Ganalalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Hare Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastute Tapta Kanchan Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishpanu Sute Devai Pranmami Hari Priye Vacha Kapta Rubyascha Kirpa Sindhu Bya Evacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Very nice, Mataji. Very nicely recited. I can clearly see the progress. Uh, in the first time when you started doing recitation of Mangalacharan, uh, there were quite some areas where you would uh, need to uh, improve. But now I think almost, I think, except at one place, you, I think, recited the full Mangalacharan perfectly. Very nice. Thank you, okay. Prabhuji. Now no, we need to go to next the next one. prayer. Yes. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Cheva Narottamam Devim Sarswatim Vyasam Tato Jayam Udirahe Nashta Pravesha Badreshu Nityam Bhagwati Sevya Bhagwati Uttam Sloke Bhaktir Bhavati Nashtiki Krishnaya Vasudevaya Devaki Nandanaya Cha Nanda Gopa Kumaraya Govindaya Namo Namaha very nice. Very nice, Mataji. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Now we move to the next part of our class, which is the recap of the previous class. And for that, I would like to invite Vasudevan Prabhu. Uh, Prabhuji have been connected with our classes right from the day one. And uh, he's also organizing his own classes. Prabhu, would you like to give little, maybe only one minute intro of your own classes that you are doing? How many students and uh, what Hare, subjects? Hare, what Krishna, are doing? Hare Krishna Prabhuji and yes, Hare sir. Krishna to all the devotees. So the classes I was doing was, uh, I'll just take a minute. So I started uh, selling the books of Gita. 
when uh, when I started selling books Gita, some friends requested, why don't you introduce to her Gita? I said, okay, I'll take a class. If you like, then I will do. So I started with a small group of about 15 people, basically family and friends. So I uh, finished one round. Then there was more requests. Then I did a second round of Gita. So two rounds of Gita have completed. Now we are doing one, one of our own literature, Sri Vaishnava literature, Vedanta Deshika. So the Vedanta Deshika stotrams we are covering, their meaning, their import, the philosophy, everything. So currently we are in the, the fifth sloka, which is Daya Satakam, which is 108 sloka hmm. on the mercy of the Lord. Okay. And uh, that is what we are doing. Very nice. So Vedanta Deshika is a very exalted Vaishnava scholarly devotee in the Shri Sampradaya, huh? the Sampradaya which was started by Ramanujachari. So, he's a very, very learned uh, person. We also sometimes uh, quote Vedanta Deshika Ji's uh, 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 works in our classes sometimes. Okay, but let us not go in a different direction. Prabhuji, please, can you introduce us yeah. to the yeah. recap of the previous class? Yeah. So, in the last class, uh, we uh, class number 23, we studied Canto 1, Chapter 8, Slokas 28 to 42. And uh, this is all uh, covering Kunti's prayers. And by the way, I am fortunate to do this uh, recap because Kunti's prayers is one of my favorite subjects in Bhagavatam. So starting with Sloka 28, uh, Kunti is saying, Your eternal time, the supreme controller, without a beginning or end, all pervasive, equal to all, moving everywhere, in all living beings and the abode of conflicting qualities. Now, the there are three important words in this sloka which uh, Prabhuji pointed out. One is kalam. Kalam means which destroys. Kalam uh, destroys those who offend devotees. Then the second important word is samam. Samam means equal to all. And then the third was yat mitakali. Yat mitakali is means there is, appears to be some conflict and this conflict is like the Lord gives us suffering as well as bliss and the Lord gives his equal as well as prejudice. He is unmerciful as well as merciful. So these are conflicting qualities, but he is equal to everybody. So that is what we covered in Sloka 28. Then Sloka 29 to 31. We move on to the next subject on the prayers, which is mysterious nature of Lord's birth and activities. In uh, 29, what uh, Kunti Devi is saying, no one can understand your transcendental past tense, which appear to be human and so are misleading. You have no object of favor, nor do you have any object of envy. People only imagine you are partial. And uh, Prabhuji gave the analogy of sun. Even though the sun is equal to all, but different uh, items behave differently because of their own properties. We'll not go into the detail in this class. Then moving on to sloka number 30, uh, Kunti Devi says, O soul of the universe, although you are unborn or aja and inactive, that is akur, uh, akurtu, akartu, akartu, you yourself descend amongst animals, men, sages, and aquatics, and verily this is bewildering. So even though the Lord is Acha, but still he uh, takes birth, he does incarnations. And she says this is bewildering. Then moving on to sloka number 31, this Yashoda took up a rope to bind you when you committed an offense. And your perturbed eyes over flooded with tears which washed the mascara from your eyes and you were afraid. Though fear personified is afraid of you, this sight is bewildering to me. Yashoda having, and uh, Prabhuji clearly explained that Yashoda having such prema was more fortunate than Danda. Because of Yashoda's prema, his Lord reciprocates with that uh, fear. And this uh, contradiction or so apparent contradiction which is bewildering is something we have read in quite detail in Isha Upanishad also, where the Slokas where says Lord is near also, Lord is far also, and uh, so on like this. So this is the uh, wonderment of the Lord. Now, moving on to Sloka number 32, 32 to 36, the subject changes. The subject is 
the various opinions about the birth of Lord. And what are the various opinions? In sloka number 32 to 34, to glorify the pious kings like Yudhishthira, to place dear devotee King Jadu. That is, and we saw the analogy of uh, Malaya and Chandan. So, the wild trees go everywhere. The special Chandan tree goes in the Malaya mountain only. So, that was the analogy. So, the Chandan glorifies the Malaya mountain. Similarly, birth of Lord glorifies King Yadu or Yadu race. Then the third one was as an answer to the prayers of Vasudeva and Devaki. Fourth was for the welfare of the world. And the fifth is to kill Asuras. And the welfare of the world and kills Asuras we have seen in Bhagavad Gita also, Paritranaya Sadhvanam and Vinashaya Desham. And then the last one was in response to Brahma's prayers. And uh, Prabhuji explained how Bhumi Devi goes and prays to Brahma and other devas pray to Brahma. And Brahma and the devas go to the shore of the Chira Sagara and pray to Chiro uh, Vishnu who answers their prayers. So these are the six reasons uh, she has listed. But then the real reason for the Lord's uh, appearance is explained in sloka number 34. Some say that you have appeared in this world to help those suffering due to their actions arising from material disease, which arises from ignorance. And uh, Prabhuji uh, clearly pointed out the sequence. We have ignorance, and because of ignorance, the material disease uh, arise, and that material disease then leads us into actions, which are uh, ca ca trapping us in this material world. So, and what is the remedy? The remedy is by engaging them in hearing and remembering about you so that they can attain prema. So, the Lord's incarnations, we read like Kithyasa Puranas. So, these are all uh, food fodder for us to talk about, fodder for us to discuss about, fodder for us to engage in satsang, etc. And this is how our devotion to the Lord increases. Then 36, sloka number, moving to sloka number 36, the potency of devotional process or potency of bhakti. Those who continuously hear, chant, repeat your transcendental activities or who take pleasure in others doing so, certainly see your lotus feet without delay, which alone can stop the repetition of birth and death. So, the birth and death is what is trapping us in Samsara Sagra. And the only way to get out of this is to perform bhakti and attain the lotus feet of the Lord. And uh, Prabhuji explained very well in this purport of this that Lord can only be seen by those who are qualified. And uh, what is a qualification? Qualification is bhakti. For example, we have seen examples in Ramayana, Vibhishna could see that he was the Lord, but Ravana could not. Similarly, Prahlad could see, but Hiranyakashipu could not. So this qualification is developed by the process of devotional service or devotional bhakti. And Prabhuji gave a wonderful example of uh, Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur in his class. And some students uh, went to, uh, in between his lecture, they got up and to have a darshan of the Lord. And he says, what did you see? You just saw some stone statue. Lord gets in through your ears. So first we have to hear about the Lord, hear about the story. And through the ears, we developed our potency so that we can realize or visualize the Lord. Then moving on to sloka number uh, 37. Now we move on to the subject of complete dependence. Oh my Lord, do you whose deeds are automatically accomplished desire to reject us today, though we are your friends and depend on you? We, having created trouble with many kings, have no other shelter than your lotus feet. And uh, Prabhuji highlighted the purport of uh, Prabhupada on this loka, which says the topmost goal of humanity is to work hard. Guidance of the Lord and 
completely dependent on him. So I'll repeat that because of its important top one. Glorifying the Lord, doing some kirtan. So that is the, let's say, bottom line or the most important message of this whole chapter, I would say. Then move on to sloka number 38. Uh, Kunti Devi continues, Who are we, the Pandavas, along with Yadus, with their fame and strength? Without your presence, we are like senses without the jiva. So the senses, only when the jiva is there in the body, the senses are operational. The moment the jiva or jivatma leaves the body, then the senses are not operational. So uh, it's a very wonderful comparison. And uh, this is the our uh, soul is where the Lord resides. And it's literally and figuratively in both ways, it is very true. Now, uh, <coughs> the next we move on to the glory of special signs on Lord's lotus feet. O holder of club, this land will not glow as it does now because it is marked with the special signs on uh, your feet. And uh, we saw that, uh, we saw even pictorially also how the Lord's feet has different marks like the conch mark or the mark of the discus, uh, different things of the Lord. And uh, fish, his uh, incarnations, these are there. And so when he walks around the Lord, these impressions form on the land. Now, the now moving on to sloka number 40 opulence is only due to your mercy now this is a very important uh, dimension that we all need to understand all these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects because the herbs and grains are in abundance the trees are full of fruits the rivers are flowing the hills are full of minerals and the oceans are full of wealth and this is due to your glancing over them. So human prosperity, this is a real measure of human prosperity and human affluence. So even today, for example, we, if the rains are not there, we are all following the monsoon and the rains closely. And this is in a way the grace of the Lord. It is coming, the rains coming in time is a grace of the Lord. And it's only when the Lord glances or graces we get all these uh, opulence. Then moving on to sloka number 41. O Lord of the universe, soul of the universe, O personality of the form of the universe, please therefore severe my tie of affection for my kinsmen, the Pandavas and the Vrishnis. Now, uh, Kunti Devi, this can be interpreted in multiple ways. Kunti Devi suddenly realizes that either Krishna in his physical, can be with them or with her relatives in Dwaraka. She is a Vrishnis. So one of them. So either way, she will feel bad. So what she is saying, she is saying, please severe my tie of affection for this so that either way, I don't uh, feel bad. And the last loka, and, uh, which is where uh, Kunti Devi almost summarizes all that she wants. Uh, let my attraction flow towards you. O oh Lord of Madhu, let my attraction be constantly drawn onto you without being diverted to anyone else. Same as the Ganges forever flows to the sea without any hindrance. So this is a very good analogy where uh, Kunti Devi seeks his mercy so that her attraction is always uh, to the Lord. So here in, in the Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada in his purport has very clearly, see, we have desire, hanker, anger, etc. All these cannot be eliminated or completely overcome when we are in this physical body, in this material world. So by what do we do? We divert this in attention of the Lord. So we divert our desire, our anchor, and our anger, anger against those who are disturbing the devotees and uh, we engage other these things on Lord. So once we are in the service of Lord, so we have diverted our attraction to the uh, Lord. And one uh, important thing is there's two important things. I'll uh, also go a little bit to the last class also. 
so without being diverted and uh, in sanskrit we call ananyatvam is it so in the last class we saw achin uh, akinchanatvam akinchanatvam and ananyatvam are very very important uh, prerequisites for bhakti as they say and uh, i'll just uh, prabhu ji with your permission i'll take a couple of minutes just to uh, give some example for akinchanatvam for example we have three acharyas in uh, three well known saints that we all are familiar ramanuja acharya vedanta acharya as well as tyagaraja the great composer of carnatic music all these three people live their life as a unchavichi brahman unchavichi brahman means they will not buy provisions every day they will go beg and uh, when they beg whatever grains they get they will cook that and eat this was their way of life all three of them one of them was a sanyasi to her grihastha especially still they followed this practice because this is the vairagya so they had this vairagya they didn't want anything even the food for them was a mercy of the lord if lord is merciful i will get the food if i don't uh, get the food they are fine so it has also happened in their life sometimes people out of affection give money instead of food they just put the money aside and they start that day so i i said this is a very good example and they lived that akinchanatvam so they didn't possess anything even their food there and they been go and beg for food they will go to discourse they will go to give some uh, sing some hymns etc and during the time people will tyagaraja will sing songs on rama he mainly composed songs on rama he will go singing his kirtanas on rama and people will uh, give him food similarly ramanaja will sing uh, either uh, pasurams of uh, one of the alwars and go and he gets so this is the way they practice that and similarly ananyatvam ananyatvam means i am totally dependent on you and only dependent on you uh, ananya ananya means none other than you and this is a very important uh, principle that is very all uh, vaishnavism this is a very important dimension apart from you nobody else can liberate me a krishna or lord vishnu is the only person who can liberate me nobody else has that gift so i am entirely dependent on thank you prabhu ji sorry for taking that extra couple of minutes no problem prabhu ji that was very nice very nice additions to describe akinchanatvam and ananyatvam uh, very nice thank you also for presenting the summary in a very succinct very with lot of clarity and uh, also keeping the time in view i think very well summarized very nicely done thank you very much prabhu ji okay uh, now we move to the next part of our uh, class which is the subject matter of today's class the fresh class and uh, we now move ahead from the 42nd verse to the 43rd verse in the 8th chapter so our idea today is to complete the whole uh, eighth chapter and then uh, try to do at least 14 verses of the next chapter which is the ninth chapter so kunti maharani's prayers are almost done uh, till 42nd verse in 43rd verse she summarizes uh, about lord krishna and then in the 44th verse the lord actually reciprocates with kunti devi's uh, prayers with some gesture so let us see what that gesture is and how kunti maharani uh, summarizes her prayers and then after that we will discuss little bit about how yudhishthir maharaj actually once come to lord krishna and then further the discussion continues forward so let us start today and but before we start for today once again i would like to take few names uh, of devotees who would like to be interested in uh, helping me in reciting the verses and also maybe reading the text okay yes i mean okay manish manish ji is in okay ji jeevan prabhu is there rakesh ji is there i can do prabhu ji and vidya mata ji is there okay so we need four people okay so we are good uh okay fine so we will start with manish ji first <clears throat> So now this is the forty-third verse. Here now Kunti Devi is summarizing the prayers, uh, 
by giving a summary of the Lord. So how she summarizes Lord Krishna, she gives some very good attributes about Lord Krishna in, in this uh, very beautiful verse. So, Manish ji, please, yes, yes. please uh, recite with me. This is Vasant Tilkam. Uh, so, anyone remember which, uh, how, what would be the melody of Vasant Tilkam, which is the, which is the other prayer that we know uh, the melody of Vasant Tilkam is similar to that prayer. Anyone remember? Anyone? So Vasant Tilkam actually is uh, same Brahma as Brahma same Samita. as Brahma Samhita. Very good. Brahma, Brahma Samhita. Samhita. Brahma Samhita. Very correct. Okay. So uh, and and what is the melody of Brahma Samhita? Anyone? Venu Kwanantam Ravinda Dalaya Taksham. Barahabatam samasitam buddha sundarangam. Like this. It goes like this. Huh? So, similarly, we will recite this. Shri Krishna Krishna Sakhavrishni Rishabhani Druga. Shri Krishna Krishna Sakhavrishni Rishabhavani Druga. Is it similar to uh, this uh, Venkatesha Suparabhata? Yeah, that I don't like. know. That I don't know, Prabhuji. Yeah. Uh, maybe that is the same. Uh, but, but first of all, let us focus. In Venkatesh Suprabhatam, I think they also recite verses from Ramayan. Shardul Vik Uttishtha Rama 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 Shardul Focus here first of all. Okay. Manish ji? Yes, yes. Shri Krishna Krishna Sakha Vrishni Rishabhavani Drug. Shri Krishna Krishna Sakha Vrishabhavani Drug. Shri Krishna. Uh, maybe other devotees can mute their microphone. Yeah. Rakesh ji? Yeah. Okay. Manish ji, once again. Shri Krishna Krishna Sakha. Shri Krishna Krishna Sakha Vrishni Rishabhava Nidra Vrishni Rishabhava Nidra Rajan Yavamsa Dahanan Rajan Yavamsa Dahanan Apavarga Virya Apavarga Virya Govinda Godvija Govinda Godvija Surarti Harabatara Surarti Hara Avatara Hara Avatara Hara Avatara Yogeshwara Kila Guru Yogeshwara Kila Guru Bhagavan Namaste Bhagavan Namaste Yeah. So that is how it will be pronounced Shri Krishna Krishna Sakavrishni Rishabhava Nidrug Rajan Yavam Sadahana Napavarga Virya Govinda God Vijasurarti Harabatara Yogeshwara Kila Guru Bhagavan Namaste. Like this. So this is Vasant Tilkam, same as Brahma Samhita. Okay, let us now focus on the, on the meaning of each of these lines. So here uh, Kunti Devi is saying, O Krishna, O friend of Arjuna, O chief amongst the descendants of Vrishni, you are the destroyer of those political parties which are disturbing elements on this earth. And then, Apavarga Virya, uh, your prowess never deteriorates. Uh, Apavarga Virya. Then, Govinda Godvija Surarti Haravatara. Then, you are the proprietor of the transcendental abode, Govinda. Govinda means you are the proprietor of the transcendental abode. You have a transcendental abode known as Golok and that is why you are known as Govinda. You are the proprietor of that transcendental abode and you descend to relieve the distress of the cows. Go Dvija Surardi Haravatara. Haravatara. Avatara means you take avatar for what? For Go. Go means cow. Dvija means Brahmana. Surarti means the, the devotees or the or the demigods, huh? the distress of the cows, the brahmanas, and the devotees. Then, 
Yogeshwara. Yogeshwara means you possess all mystic powers. You are Yogeshwara. You are the uh, you are the topmost of the yogis. And then Akhila Guru. Akhila Guru means you are the preceptor of the entire universe. You are the Jagat Guru. Akhila Guru means you are the Jagat Guru. You teach everyone how to live. Then Bhagavan Namaste to such a person. Uh, you are the Almighty God, Bhagavan Namaste, and I offer you my respectful obeisances. So this is kind of summarizing the Lord's glories in a very beautiful verse by Kunti Devi. So, for example, she's saying that you are actually the, uh, uh, this is something what Prabhupada also mentions in the purport that Kunti Devi actually summarizes about Lord Krishna. She, she says that you are living in the, you are living in the uh, spiritual world where there are a lot of cows and then uh, there are a lot of Lakshmis which are uh, serving you there. And then you come to this world, you come to this material world to uh, to uh, destroy the political uh, miscreants and to actually uh, uplift your devotees. Uh, and then you have unlimited strength. You have uh, so much of uh, uh, so much of uh, uh, bravery and so on. So like this, it is something like summarizing uh, all the Lord's glories in one beautiful verse by Kunti Devi. So Kunti Devi is now concluding his her prayers by giving a, a, a summary of Lord's glories in this verse number 43. And then in response, in reciprocation to the prayers of Kunti Devi, what does Lord Krishna do? Lord Krishna reciprocates with the prayers of Kunti Devi with a very enchanting smile. So that is the Lord's response. Huh? So uh, that is what, uh, that is how the Lord reciprocates to the uh, to the effort or to the devotion of the devotees of the Lord. So, uh, Maniji, please can you read from here? Yes. Suta Goswami said, The Lord, thus hearing the prayers of Kunti Devi, composed in choice words for his glorification, mildly smiled. Hmm. That smile was an enchanting as his mystic power, Mayaya. Hmm. So that is what the Lord did when he when he heard the prayers of Kunti Devi. Actually, the devotees throughout their life do their devotional service not for gaining any power, not for gaining any name, not for gaining any prestige. But the devotee's life is successful after if after end of their devotional life or if they when when they reach the Supreme Lord's abode. And the Lord welcomes the devotee with a simple, gentle, mild smile. So his smile is as enchanting as the Lord himself. That captivates the heart. That attracts the attention of the devotee so nicely. So that is what is the difference between the, the object of uh, peoples who are materialistic in nature, who are running after or hankering after power, prestige, name. But for devotee, simply Lord's smile at the end of the day is all what they need. So this is what Srila Prabhupada also mentions something uh, uh, in his purport. Manishi, please read from here. Lord is easily satisfied by devotees' prayers. Srimati Kunti Devi has prayed to the Lord just to enunciate a fragment of his glories. All his devotees worship him in that way by chosen words and therefore the Lord is known as Uttama Shloka. No amount of chosen words is sufficient to enumerate the Lord's glory. And yet, he is satisfied by such prayers as the father is satisfied even by broken linguistic attempts of the growing child. Hmm. So this is what Prabhupada is trying to say, that the Lord, although it is not possible to glorify the Lord, uh, we try to glorify the Lord with the best of the poetry, with best of our intentions, with best of our abilities. But... Lord is so vast, Lord is so big that our simple explanation of the Lord or simple glorification of the Lord is not sufficient to actually do the justice to the Lord's glories. The Lord's glories are unlimited and we only simply try to glorify the Lord with some poetry in at our disposal. So what uh, Prabhupada ji is writing here in the purport is that the Lord is so magnanimous that he is satisfied by such prayers. And he's making one analogy here. He's giving this analogy that when the father hears uh, the, the speech of his uh, young boy or young child, 
uh, even though the speech is not properly composed it is broken uh, like in hindi we call it tutla ke bolna so even if it is broken linguistic attempt by the growing child the father feels very very happy the father feels very satisfied by hearing even the uh, broken linguistic speech of his growing child so similarly the lord is very easily satisfied by devotee's prayers if it is, has been uh, if it has been if it has been presented with a devotional heart bhav grahi janardan that is how our lord is and then uh, in the in the same purport shila prabhupad elaborates on the meaning of the word maya typically we hear the word maya in a negative connotation but there is a positive understanding also of maya which prabhupad is explaining here because in this particular verse uh, it is mentioned that the smile of the lord was actually as enchanting as the yoga shakti of the lord so let us see what prabhupad explain prabhu please read from here yeah the word maya is used both in sense of delusion and mercy here in the word maya is used in the sense of lord's mercy upon kunti devi yeah so as i was explaining in some of my other classes uh, like prabhupad has taught this thing that maya could be uh, maha maya and maya could also be yog maya yog maya means where the lord's uh, energy or this internal potency uh, because of this internal potency of the lord the lord makes the living entity forgets that he is the lord and that enables uh, very loving dealings between the devotee and the lord so the lord does not think uh, that the devotee does not think that he is the supreme personality of godhead and that's how the reciprocation of love between the devotee and the lord actually happens so for example when yashoda mai was uh, was punishing lord krishna or, or running after or showing her anger to the lord uh, the, yashoda mai was not thinking that actually he is supreme personality of godhead yashoda mai was always thinking that he is my son and if he is doing these kind of mischiefs uh, he will not be he will not be a responsible adult when he grows up so i need to correct him and that's how in that natural mood she tries to rebuke or she tries to scold lord krishna and that is what that is happens because of only the yog maya yog shakti of the uh, internal potency of the lord so that is what the meaning of the word maya here is uh, that it is mercy of the lord which has been coming through uh, her smile to kunti devi okay now most of the class today will be a story line so you will not expect much of the verses that we will sing uh, and as it is the story line it will be more of the translation that we will be reading from the uh, from the class okay prabhu please can you read here yes thus accepting the prayers of shrimati kunti devi the lord subsequently informed other ladies of his departure by entering the palace of hastinapura but upon preparing to leave he was stopped by king yudhishthir who implored him lovingly hmm. so now you can see lord is trying to go to dwarka so first of all we saw in the previous chapters when the lord was preparing to leave for leave from hastinapur and depart for dwarka then uttara came running uh, pahi pahi jagat guru uh, please save me you can only save me and then lord gets engaged in saving uh, parikshit uh in the womb of uh, putra and then uh, after he was freed from that activity then he started again moving towards dwarka then kunti devi started offering her elaborate prayers to the lord so the lord uh, very patiently heard kunti devi's prayers and reciprocated by a smile now that prayer is over the lord krishna is now entering hastinapur's palace where he is once again taking permission from other ladies that uh, mothers i am actually leaving for dwarka please give me your blessings and so on but now when he is in the palace of hastinapur again uh, yudhishthir maharaj uh, comes to lord krishna and then pleads him that please my dear lord please don't go please stay here at hastinapur for some more days uh, so yudhishthir maharaj actually was very much morose he was very much lamenting the fact that uh, the war of mahabharat is now over and the whole war of mahabharat in which millions and millions of people have lost their lives and all that actually happened to make me the king 
to give me the throne of Hastinapur, all of these people actually died. And so many millions of these people have died. That is why Yudhishthir Maharaj was actually feeling very, very sad. Uh, all this has happened because of me. In that mood of sadness, in that mood of moroseness, Yudhishthir Maharaj now once again approaches to Lord Krishna, requesting him, pleading him, my dear Lord, please can you stay here for some more days? So that is what 45th verse is saying. 46th and 47th verse, <clears throat> uh, uh, Maharaj Yudhishthir uh, is uh, the the uh, has been further disclaimed. Uh, Manishji, please can you read from here? Yeah. Maharaja Yudhishthir was aggrieved like a common materialistic man over the death of his friends. No one, including great sages headed by Vyasa and even Krishna, Agbhuta, Karmana, could pacify him despite all historical evidence. Hmm. Now here, Yudhishthir Maharaj's state of mind is explained. Uh, Maharaj Yudhishthir was aggrieved like a common materialistic man over the death of his friends. So we see in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna, when he was about to start that battle of Mahabharat, he was also confused. He was also lamenting profusely. My dear sir, I am not able to understand what is my duty. What should I do? Here I see my relatives in front of me. How should I kill them? But here we see that after the Mahabharat war is over, the same uh, symptom are seen in Maharaj Yudhishthir. Uh, Maharaj Yudhishthir was aggrieved like a common materialistic man like a common materialistic man. So a difference between a devotee and a common materialistic man is that a devotee actually understand that this all relationships that we are talking about are only temporary. Uh, it is our duty towards the Lord. It is our duty to as per our dharma. That is all what counts the, counts the most. Similarly, here Maharaj Yudhishthir was also behaving something like a common man like what, what we saw in Bhagavad Gita for Arjuna. He is aggrieving for the death of his friends and no one including great sages headed by Vyas and even Krishna uh, could pacify him despite all historical evidence. So all the sages including Vyas Dev tried to pacify Yudhishthir Maharaj, sir, my dear sir, there is no cause for lamentation. We all did this Mahabharat war. It was all commonly agreed. We all understood that Duryodhan was not the right king. And Lord Krishna also wanted to make you the king. So all those arguments were given by Vyasadeva. Uh, historical evidences were given. Even Lord Krishna made an attempt to pacify Yudhishthir Maharaj. But even Lord Krishna was also not able to pacify Yudhishthir Maharaj. And here, Lord Krishna has been described as Adbhut Karmana. So there is a special word mentioned here for Lord Krishna, which is Adbhut Karmana. Now, Adbhut Karmana means what? Adbhut Karmana, uh, say Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord. He knows everyone's heart. He is all powerful. Uh, he is he's, he's all controller. He's, he, can, he can control everything. So he can even control Yudhishthir Maharaj's emotions also. But here, why it is mentioned Adbhut Karmana? It is mainly for one specific reason. So what is happening here is that Lord Krishna, although externally is trying to pacify Yudhishthir Maharaj, but Lord Krishna is also situated in the heart of Yudhishthir Maharaj as Paramatma. So externally as Lord Krishna, externally as the uh, friend of Yudhishthir Maharaj, as the relative of Yudhishthir Maharaj, Lord Krishna is trying to explain to Yudhishthir that don't worry, sir, you did no wrong. It was all uh, agreed by everyone and it was all according to the Dharmic codes. We have, we have fought this war of Mahabharat. But internally, as Paramatma situated in the heart of Yudhishthira Maharaj, Lord Krishna as Paramatma is saying, don't listen to my arguments. Don't listen what I am going to say. Uh, please don't agree to what I am saying. So what is this? This is actually Adbhut Karmana. So externally he is giving arguments, but internally he is actually trying to tell Yudhishthira Maharaj, don't listen to my arguments. So this is actually uh, uh, what is being mentioned here is as Adbhut Karmana. His actions are actually bewildering. He is Adbhut. He is wonderful. And why Lord Krishna is doing so? Lord Krishna is doing so because Lord Krishna actually wants to establish the glories of Bhishma Dev. Uh, he wanted to take Yudhishthir Maharaj to Bhishma Dev and wanted that Bhishma Dev actually pacify Yudhishthir Maharaj instead of me. So instead of 
establishing his own glories uh, as we know that lord is bhaktavatsala he is very much interested in establishing the glories of his devotees and not his own glories so in the same mood uh, lord krishna wants that the glories of bhishma dev should be established that uh, there was a situation when even i could not pacify yudhishthir but uh, bhishma dev was able to pacify yudhishthir maharaj after he was lamenting and he was feeling very morose after the mahabharat war so that was the main purpose that was the primary purpose but there were other purposes also because of this arrangement that when yudhishthir maharaj would go to bhishma dev lord krishna actually will also be able to present before bhishma dev and bhishma dev would be able to have lord's darshan so bhishma dev was a great exalted devotee of the lord and lord wanted to make bhishma dev's departure very glorious and that is how lord arranged for all this and that is why he is known as adbhut karmana so very beautifully explained by prabhupada ji huh? all these things so let us see why the lord is called as adbhut karmana prabhupad mentions please read prabhu ji yeah here krishna is called adbhut karmana because he performed a remarkable action of bewildering yudhishthira making him incapable of understanding the teachings of krishna and vyasa hmm. also by having bhishma enlighten yudhishthira krishna announced the glories of bhishma as having more knowledge of dharma than that of sages vyasa and even himself further krishna wanted to make his pure devotee bhishma happy by giving him darshana at the time of his death yes so you understood why the lord is known as called as adbhut karmana because he actually wanted to glorify bhishma dev and uh, wanted to establish that bhishma dev is actually more knowledgeable than the sages even to uh, even more knowledgeable than krishna himself and then krishna also wanted to make his pure devotee bhishma happy by giving his darshan at the time of his death so these are some of the confidential reasons by uh, why lord is known as adbhut karmana <clears throat> okay let us uh, okay now we go to our next devotee jivan prabhu would you like to read from here uh, please read okay, the 48 okay prabhu ji okay prabhu ji text number the... 48 oh my lord oh my lord i am the most uh, sinful man just see my heart which is full of ignorance this body which is ultimately meant to for others has killed many many accomplices of men accomplices Achovanismen, Atman. Forty-nine. Hmm. I have killed many boys, brahmanas, well-wishers, friends, parents, preceptors, and brothers. Though I live millions of years, I will not be relieved from the hell that awaits me for all these sins. Yeah. So, as I was mentioning, here in forty-eighth and forty-ninth verse, Yudhishthir Maharaj is actually presenting and opening up his heart before Lord Krishna. so what happened with arjuna before the mahabharat war is actually happening with yudhishthir maharaj after the mahabharat war he is now feeling very very bad very very morose that because of only to make him the king of hastinapur so many people actually died and not only uh, not only the soldiers who participated in the war but actually there were boys brahmanas well wishers friends parents preceptors uh, brothers etc uh, and then it so uh, so worse Uh, was the condition of uh, yudhishthir maharaj's mind in this point that he mentioned that though i live millions of years i will not be relieved from the hell that awaits me for all that sins so he is he is feeling very much remorseful very much repenting uh, whatever he has done through the uh, mahabharat war so in one way uh, it is mainly because lord wanted to use yudhishthir maharaj's bewilderment to serve his own purpose to glorify bhishma dev to make bhishma dev departure much more glorious but at the same time we also see here that yudhishthir maharaj was very much detached he was not attached to the throne of hastinapur he was not seeing that now the time has come i have to climb the throne of hastinapur and become the king of the whole world he is not thinking like this his his heart is very devotional so he is thinking uh, he is thinking that because of him only all this trouble has come to so many people now let us see what prabhupad has to say in the purport yes prabhu please read 
purport 1.8.48 and 49. The body is meant for serving others. The body is, after all, meant for others. While there is life in the body, it is meant for the service of others. And when it is dead, it is meant to be eaten by dogs and jackals or uh, maggots. Yudhishthira is sorry because for such a temporary body, such a huge massacre was committed. Okay, let me go back to the 48th verse. Hmm. Here he is saying, O oh my Lord, I am the most sinful man, just see my heart, which is full of ignorance. This body, which is ultimately meant for others, has killed many, many Akshohinis of men. Akshohini means, Akshohini is actually a count. And there were many Akshohini Senas or Akshohini army that were engaged in the battlefield of Mahabharata. And if you see the purport of 48th verse, Prabhupada actually uh, highlights how many Ratha, how many chariots are there, how many elephants are there, how many uh, soldiers are there, soldier foot soldiers are there, and how many uh, horse riders are there in an, in an Akshohini. And this is uh, the count that is given in the purport is only for one Akshohini. And here, Yudhishthir Maharaj is saying that because of me, so many Akshohinis of men have been killed. And and I am the owner of this body who has been engaged in this kind of ghastly affair. Actually, the body is ultimately meant for others. The body is not meant for enjoyment. The body is meant for doing paropkar. The body is actually meant for serving others. Similarly, elaborating on that point, Prabhupada is mentioning here, this body is after all meant for others. While there is life in the body, it is meant for service of others. So, Yudhishthir is feeling sorry because for such a temporary body, such a huge massacre was committed. So, only for a temporary body, so many people actually died. That is why he was lamenting. Next, Prabhuji. Why mention boys, brahmanas, etc. Whenever there is a war, there is certainly a massacre of uh, many innocent living beings, uh, such as boys, brahmanas and women, whose killing is considered to be the greatest of sins. They are all innocent uh, creatures, and in all circumstances, killing of them is forbidden in the scriptures. Yeah, so like you see in the previous verse, uh, Yudhishthir Maharaj in 49th verse is saying that I have killed many Brahmanas, boys, well-wishers, friends, and so on. And Prabhupada is explaining that why he is mentioning boys and Brahmanas. So boys and Brahmanas did not participate in the war. So Prabhupada is saying that when there is a war, uh, then it is uh, there is certainly a massacre of many innocent living and living beings also. For example, boys, brahmanas, and women, and they are all innocent creatures. And in all circumstances, their killing has to be stopped. Their killing has should not be done. So Maharaj Yudhishthir is feeling so much lamentation that because of him, many innocent people also got killed in the war. That is how his state of mind is right now. Okay. Next, Prabhuji. Hmm. 48 to 52, Maharaj Yudhishthira's uh, lamentation. 50. There is no sin for a king who kills uh, for the right cause of protecting the citizens, but that rule is not applicable to me. Hmm. 51. By material welfare work, I cannot counteract the pain I have inflicted on the women whose husbands or sons I have killed. Hmm. So here he's saying that the king's responsibility is, I can understand if the king is doing some killing, engaged in the warfare, mainly for the protection of the citizens. But for some right cause, if it is done for protecting the citizen, I can understand. But that rule does not apply to me. This war has been fought only for making me the king of Hastinapur. There was no other reason. And so that is why he's feeling very much uh, depressed. And then in the 51st verse, he's saying that if I do any kind of welfare work, any punya, any yagya, any homa, any charity, if I do, I cannot counteract the pain I have inflicted on the women whose husbands or sons I have killed. Because of me, many women became widow or many, many, many women became childless. Yeah? Any welfare work, any kind of charitable work, if I do, any kind of pious work, if I do, I cannot get rid of this sin. Uh, so this is how Yudhishthir Maharaj is feeling right now. Now, let us see the Yudhishthir's thought process. Now, when he is speaking these verses, what he is thinking? Prabhu, please read. Yudhishthir's thought process. 
Maharaja Yudhishthira thought that although he was not actually involved in the administration of the kingdom, which was being carried on well by Duryodhana without harm to citizens, he caused the killing of so many living beings only for his personal gain of the kingdom from the hands of Duryodhana. Yeah, so Yudhishthira Maharaj is thinking that before me, Duryodhana was ruling the kingdom. And in Duryodhana's kingdom also, he was actually doing an okay job. Uh, there was no uh, there was no citizen in his kingdom who was uh, who was threatened of life and he was uh, he was uh, actually administrating the kingdom properly and only to make me the king this so many so much massacre has happened so many people have been killed so that's how he's thinking right now okay now next point best, way, best way to counteract karmic reaction the way of work karma is like that it creates one action and another reaction simultaneously and thus increases the chain of material activities, binding the performer in material bondage. In the Bhagavad Gita 9.27-28, the remedy is suggested that such actions and reactions of the path of work can be checked only when work is done on behalf of the Supreme Lord. Yeah, so if we do any action which is not according to the guidelines of the Supreme Lord, then we are bound to get reaction. But if we are doing some activity which are which are as per the rules and guidelines of the Supreme Lord, then we should not get any reaction. We actually do not get any reaction. And we learn this from Bhagavad Gita. But Yudhishthir Maharaj is feeling bewildered. Yudhishthir Maharaj is forgetting that this whole Mahabharat war was not fought as per the whims and fancies of anybody. Actually, the whole Mahabharat war was the will and the stand of Supreme Lord Krishna was there. So, Supreme Mahabharat war, when the Pandava fought this Mahabharat war, it was not to satisfy their own whims and fancies. Actually, they fought the Mahabharat war was to satisfy the Lord. So, there was no way to understand this, that Mahabharat war was not a devotional activity. It was a devotional activity because it was the will of the Lord. So, Yudhishthira Maharaj... Uh, uh, is forgetting all these uh, understanding. But here in, in this purport, Srila Prabhupada is reminding us that if we get any karmic reaction, if we do it with our own whims and fancies, with, with the materialistic way of mind, we, if we do some activity, we get a karmic reaction. But if we do it as per the Lord's instruction, we don't get any karmic reaction. Okay. Now we go to the concluding verse of this chapter. Yeah. Prabhu, please. Verse number 52. As it is not possible to filter muddy water through mud, or purify a wine-stained pot with wine. It is not possible to counteract the killing of men by sacrificing animals. Yeah, so why this mention of sacrificing animals? The mention of sacrificing animals is being mentioned here by Yudhishthira Maharaj because he is about to perform this Ashwamedha Yajna. Uh, he's, he has performed this Ashwamedha Yajna, Raj Suya Yajna, in which uh, the horse is sacrificed. So he's saying that he's giving an analogy that if there is a muddy water, if there is a water in which some mud is there, you cannot clean the water by filtering it through the mud. You cannot clean it. Similarly, if there is a pot in which uh, a wine is there, uh, the pot is used to contain wine or liquor, uh, alcohol, uh, you cannot clean that pot using alcohol. So similarly, uh, I have done this offense of killing so many millions of people I cannot overcome this offense by killing some animals. Killing, killing some animals means killing uh, done in a Ashwamedha Yajna. So that is how Yudhishthir Maharaj is thinking that uh, by it is not possible to filter muddy water through mud or purify a wine stained pot with wine. Similarly, it is not possible to counteract the killing by sacrificing animals. So here we conclude the 8th chapter of the Canto 1. Now we are moving to the ninth chapter and my target is to actually finish the first 14 verses. Uh, the title of this chapter is The Passing Away of Bhishma Deva. So this is uh, the overview map of this chapter number 9. Primarily in this chapter what is happening is that Lord Krishna is now going to bring Yudhishthir Maharaj to Bhishma Dev and he will allow Bhishma Dev to pacify Yudhishthir Maharaj. And then ultimately Bhishmadev will pass away and 
Bhishma Dev will speak some prayers to Lord Krishna before passing away, and Lord will actually uh, give his darshan to Bhishma Dev on this very uh, special occasion of passing away of a very exalted devotee of the Lord. So that is the primary crux of this chapter, as explained in various subsections here, where which also includes one prayer by Bhishma Dev. Few verses are there in uh, uh, explain the Bhishma Dev prayers to the Lord. and then uh, bhishma dev pacifies and encourages pandavas like that these are the uh, main topics in this particular chapter so let us start with this <clears throat> now i will request uh, rakesh prabhu to kindly start reading the uh, uh, the, uh, the text here text number 1 yeah sud goswami said being afraid for having killed so many subjects Yudhishthira went to the scene of the massacre. There, Bhishma Dev was lying on a bed of arrows, about to pass away. Yeah, so Bhishma Dev had this uh, boon of ichcha mrityu. Uh, he could pass away at at whatever time he would like. Uh, so he had that uh, had had that boon uh, available to him. And then it is once again said that uh, Pandavas uh, Yudhishthir went to the scene of the battle battlefield where. Bhishma Dev was lying on the bed of arrows, as you can see in the picture, and he is about to depart. Let us see what to expect in chapter nine. I briefly give you an explanation, but Prabhupada also write this in the purport. Yeah. In this ninth chapter, as it is built by Lord Shri Krishna, Bhishma Dev will impart instructions to King Yudhishthira on the subject of occupational duties. Hmm. Bhishma Dev will also offer his last prayer to the Lord. on the verge of passing away from his, this mortal world and thus become liberated from the bondage of further material engagements yes so bhishma dev will give updesh to king yudhishthir he will pacify uh, bhishma yudhishthir maharaj and he will also educate him how to rule uh, how to perform his dharma and then uh, next is bhishma dev will offer prayer to the lord before departing and the lord will give darshan to bhishma dev at the time of his departure okay next one prabhu ji at that time all his brothers followed him on beautiful chariots drawn by first class horses decorated with gold ornaments with them were vyas and rishis like dhamma and others hmm. o say amongst the brahmans lord shri krishna the personality of godhead also followed seated on a chariot with arjuna thus king yudhishthira appeared very aristocratic like kuvera surrounded by his companions yeah so in these verse number 2 and 3 a description of the entourage which was following yudhishthira maharaj has been given and the main point in these two verses is that it was very aristocratic very aristocratic means very royal uh, very royal means they were very nicely dressed there the uh, chariots were decorated with gold ornaments horses were decorated with gold ornaments there were also rishis like vyasa and dhamya who were part of the court of yudhishthir maharaj they were also part of that entourage and then <clears throat> lord krishna himself was also in that in that assembly of uh, people who were going to uh, going to the battlefield where uh, bhishma dev was lying on the bed of arrows so uh, yudhishthir maharaj entourage has been compared as aristocratic as kuber kuber is the uh, finance minister or i would say the i would say the treasurer of the devatas so because he is the treasurer of devatas it is it is it is understood that he would be very very opulent so yudhishthir maharaj entourage was very aristocratic very opulent very royal when he it was going to meet bhishma dev and prabhupad uh, gives the reason uh, why it was like that please read from here why pandavas went to bhishma deva aristocratically dressed lord shri krishna wanted the pandavas to be present before bhishma deva in the most aristocratic order so that he might be pleased to see them happy at the time of his death yes so bhishma dev uh, bhishma dev's heart desire was to see pandavas to rule the kingdom of hastinapur although he was uh on the side of the kauravas although he was supporting duryodhan and his companions but within his heart he always wanted to see yudhishthir and the righteous 
and the devotional devotees pandavas to rule the kingdom of hastinapur and uh, lord krishna purposefully wanted that yudhishthir and his associates go to meet bhishma dev in a very royal in a very aristocratic way and why it is so because bhishma dev will feel very happy to see yudhishthir as the king of hastinapur uh, the whole battle of mahabharat was fought to make uh, yudhishthir the king of hastinapur and bhishma dev also wanted that uh, yudhishthir to become the king of hastinapur although he fought against yudhishthir uh, but within his heart he wanted like that and that is why uh, they went very aristocratically and by seeing uh, pandavas very aristocratically dressed bhishma dev was very much pleased bhishma dev was very happy to see them like that uh, atul prabhu can you please mute your microphone just give me one second पांडव किंग युधिंग विद हिज यंग ब्रदर्स एंड लॉर्ड कृष्ण बोट डाउन बिफोर हिम so in this verse we are we see that uh, when uh, the pandavas and uh, uh, lord krishna along with yudhishthir maharaj they approached they approached bhishma dev they all bowed down before them they all paid their obeisances obeisances they did pranam to all uh, to bhishma dev so here uh, understanding that pandavas yudhishthir maharaj and other pandavas arjun bhima nakul sahadev bowing down before bhishma dev is understandable but why would lord shri krishna who is supreme personality of godhead would want to bow down before bhishma dev so the reason has been explained in the purport by prabhu pad please read prabhu why lord krishna bowed before bhishma the lord although conscious of his supreme position always behaved in a humanly custom and and so he also bowed down before the dying bhishma deva as if he were one of the younger brothers of king yudhishthira hmm so although the lord is aware that he is the supreme lord but when he is in this material world doing his pastimes he doesn't behave or he doesn't uh, he doesn't uh, i would say uh, 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 he doesn't uh, show his godhood in general that i am god i am god he is not interested in in that kind of a show off so he is uh, he behaves like in a social way in a in a as whatever is required for, from the social customs so as per the social customs he is the brother of yudhishthir maharaj he is the younger brother of uh, cousin younger brother of yudhishthir maharaj so when the pandavas bowed down before bhishma dev king lord krishna also did the same activity uh, and he also bowed down before bhishma dev okay now next one prabhu ji please read 5 to 8 Great souls from all over the universe had assembled to see Bhishma Deva, Parvata, Narada, Bharat, Bharat, Bharatashwa, Bharatashwa, Bharatwaja, Bharatwaja, Parshurama, Vasistha, Gautama, Atri, Sukhadev Goswami, Kashyap, Angri, Angirasa, Angiras, etc. As well as their disciples. yeah so here in this fifth to eighth verse 5 to 8 there is a long list of devotees there is a long list of sages has been given because this was not an ordinary moment in the history of world a very exalted devotee like bhishma dev was about to depart and that devotee also had this boon of ichcha mrityu so lord krishna wanted to make all this arrangement that the departure of bhishma dev should be as glorious as possible so uh, great sage is great souls from all over the universe assembled and there is a list a long list has been given parvat muni narad muni brihadashva bharadwaj muni parushram vasishta gautam atri shukadev goswami kashyap angiras etc 
and their disciples all were there all were there who had come to witness the departure the glorious departure of bhishma dev and also not only to witness the glorious departure but bhishma dev was about to counsel but was about to lecture uh, yudhishthir maharaj was about to pacify the pandavas so that also they wanted to witness they wanted to listen because bhishma dev was was great knowledgeable person on dharma on the topic of dharma so that is how all of them assembled here and if you see the purport by shila prabhupad of uh, these verses prabhupad has explained uh, briefly about each of these personalities like who is parvat muni who is narad muni who is dhamya uh, who is badrayan who is brahadascha who is bharadwaj and so on so we were we are not going to go to discuss each of these personalities but uh, you may like to read these purports to understand little bit more about the background of each of these personalities so that is the uh, background behind this verse prabhu please read the ninth verse also bhishma hmm. deva welcomed all of them properly for he knew dharma as applicable to time and place Hmm, a very nice verse. Bhishma Dev welcomed all of them properly, for he knew dharma as applicable to time and place. Huh? So time and place. This has been specifically mentioned in this per, uh, in this verse. So let us see what does it mean by time and place. Huh? How did Bhishma Dev welcomed everyone? Please read from here. Bhishma Deva was certainly unable at that time to welcome and receive them physically. because he was neither at his home nor in a normal healthy condition hmm. but he was quite fit by the activities of his sound mind and therefore he could utter sweet words with hearty expressions and all of them were well received or well very well received so bhishma dev has been mentioned that he was very knowledgeable in the uh, knowledgeable in dharma uh, and then when the guests had come so many guests so many exalted personalities have come from all over the universe and bhishma dev a very knowledgeable person in dharma uh, it is it is expected it is very natural for him to receive these guests in a very appropriate manner so when a guest comes to our house what do we do we we receive the guest with uh, with a welcoming uh, demeanor with welcoming behavior we offer the guest a seat of honor to sit in our house uh, we also offer the guest some drinks uh welcome drinks to uh to to enjoy when they when they come to our house we speak the guests with some sweet words we listen to them we listen we ask them their uh, how have they been what they have been doing so far and so on bhishma dev position was very awkward at this moment he was lying on the bed of arrows he could not get up he could not uh, leave his seat of bed of arrows stand up and uh, and welcome the guests by maybe by embracing them by maybe shaking hands with them by doing all kind of other uh, other gestures he could not do that so neither he was at home nor he could offer any drinks any any prasadam uh, to the guest at that moment so what did he do because he was knowledgeable in dharma and at the right time and the right circumstances whatever you are in a in a, in the position what did he do he offered sweet words he could he offered Uh, he offered his respects in the mind to those guests and by his sweet words he actually appropriately welcomed all the great souls who had come to uh, witness his departure from this world so dharma is not only about doing activities as a list uh, so this is a to do list and if i have to follow dharma i have to do this 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 no according to time and place according to the circumstances uh, the dharma actually can change can be calibrated can be adjusted uh, ultimate aim of dharma is to bring the living entity close to the lord that is the ultimate aim that aim should be satisfied and it should not be a dogmatic or a uh, uh, or a uh, uh, something like following in a very religious manner ticking the items one by one no it is not ticking the checklist but actually it is the intention it is the purpose of the dharma one should understand Now let us see what is meant by dharma according to time and place. Here, Prabhupada explains. Expert, reli expert religionists know perfectly well how to adjust religious principles in terms of time and place. 
there are different climates and situations in different parts of the world. And if one has to discharge his duties to preach the message of the Lord, he must be expert in adjusting things in terms of the time and place. Yes. So we, for example, normally in the ISKCON temple, the Mangal Arati is at 4.30 a.m. Now, if somebody wants to start a bhakti center or wants to start a temple in a, in a Western country or maybe in a European country or maybe in a country like Russia where there is very, uh, very acute winters are there. And if you expect that we should start Mangal Arati at 4.30 a.m. and nobody turns up and then he becomes uh, uh, morose or sad uh, that nobody is actually responding to my call, then he should understand. So ultimate purpose is not that he should start the Mangal Arati at 4.30. Rather, he should. the ultimate purpose is that the law, devotees actually start to come to the temple and uh, take darshan of the Lord, uh, associate with the devotees, do some Arati, Kirtan, Katha, etc. So that time of 4.30 a.m. can be adjusted to maybe something like 7 a.m. in the morning or maybe 8 a.m. in the morning where it is much more convenient for the people to come to the temple. So like this, that is what Prabhupada is saying, that there are different climates and situations in different parts of the world. And if one has to discharge his duties to preach the message of the Lord, he must be expert in adjusting things in terms of time and place. So an intelligent devotee uh, know what is the ultimate purpose of these scriptures. The ultimate purpose of dharma is to bring people close to the Lord. And in order to do that, if some adjustment has to be done according to the time, place and circumstances, that is acceptable. <clears throat> okay, now I invite Vidya Mataji for the rest of the class to recite the verses and the, read the text. So now, <clears throat> uh, now we are talking about uh, one of the verses, uh, one of the verses where uh, 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 Bhishma Dev is speaking, and uh, it is regarding some worship of Krishna. <clears throat> so let us let us recite this verse. This is the tenth verse. Let me open it here. Eighth, ninth, and tenth. Okay. Krishnam cha tat prabhavagya. Krishnam cha tat prabhavajanya. Krishnam cha tat prabhavagya. Krishna cha tat prabhavagya gana. Asi nam jagatishwaram. Asi nam jagatishwaram. Hridistham puja yamasa. Hridishatham puja nayam sa. Maya yo pata vigraham. Maya yo patam pata vigraham. Hmm. So, hmm. what Lord Krishna, what, uh, what is being mentioned here is. <clears throat> hmm? uh, Bhishma Dev, knowing the glories of Lord Krishna, worshipped him who is Lord of the universe. Krishnam cha tat prabhavagya. So Bhishma Dev knows the glories of Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna knows glories of Bhishma Dev. And then Asinam Jagat Ishwaram. He is situated as the Lord of the universe. Bhishma Dev knows who is Lord Krishna. He is the Lord of the universe. And then Hridistham Puja Yamasa. He is situated within the heart. Hirdi Astham Puja Yamasa. He is the worshipable personality uh, and he is worshipped as Hirdi Astham. He is situated within the heart. And Maya Yo Patta, Maya Yo Patta Vigraham. He manifests his transcendental form by his internal potency. So these are some of the thoughts that are running in the mind of Bhishma Dev when he is welcoming everyone in the assembly. So he is welcoming all the sages, he is also welcoming Lord Krishna. And while welcoming Lord Krishna, these are the thoughts going on in the mind of Bhishma Dev that he is the Lord of the universe, he is situated within everyone's <laughs> heart and his form is transcendental. And why it is transcendental? Because of his internal potency. Let us read the text for 11th verse. Yes. <clears throat> the sons of Maharaja Pandu were sitting silently nearby overtaken with affection for their dying grandfather. Seeing this, Bhishma Dev congratulated them with feeling. There were tears of ecstasy in his eyes, for he was overwhelmed by love and affection. Yes, now 
the emotional uh, the emotional state of mind of bhishma dev has been explained in this verse so in the previous verse we thought we saw how bhishma dev was feeling about lord krishna in this verse it is being mentioned that how bhishma dev was feeling about his grandchildren his grandchildren like the pandavas so the pandavas for pandavas bhishma dev had a very emotional a very parently or a very uh, motherly kind of heartfelt feelings at the moment uh, when he was witnessing them sitting nearby very silently very very gently they were sitting nearby bhishma dev and this was and at this moment he was overtaken by with their affection uh, and then uh, bhishma dev congratulates them with feeling and there were tears of ecstasy in his eyes and prabhupad gives a very beautiful account of uh, the the state of mind of bhishma dev in his purport let us read that yes why bhishma dev became overwhelmed with emotion when maharaja pandu died his sons were all small children and naturally they were brought up under the affection of elderly members of the royal family specifically by bisham dev later on when the pandavas were cheated by kauravas bisham dev although knowing that pandavas were innocent could not take their side for political reasons at this at the last stage of his life <clears throat> when bisham dev was uh, saw his grandson sitting very gently at his side he could not check his loving tears he remembered the great tribulations suffered by his most pious grandsons mm -hmm. certainly he was the most satisfied man because of yudhishthira's being and throned in place of duryodhan and thus he began to congratulate them yes so the emotions that are running now in the mind of bhishma dev is he is thinking of very distant past bhishma dev is thinking of that time when the father of these pandavas had passed away so any one any elderly person in the family would become worried uh, these children are so young their father have gone their father has passed away what will happen to the future of these children who will take care of these children and then in that emotion uh, bhishma dev would actually provide extra affection to these pandavas and then the whole child of these pandavas bhishma dev would play with them would give his affection to all these pandavas and then not only this but bhishma dev was also witness of how the kauravas cheated these pandavas how the pandavas were always in some kind of trouble some trouble or other because of these kauravas and bhishma dev although knowing that they are innocent he could not help them he could not take side with them you know because of political reasons so he understood that these pandavas his grandchildren have had such a struggle right from their childhood when their father passed away till the time they grew up till the time they were actually became adults and they want they were ready to take some kingdom some some job like that they always had difficulties some kind of other and now when he saw that yudhishthir and the other uh, brothers of yudhishthir were dressed in an aristocratic attire uh, they were sitting silently they have won the mahabharat war lo tears of love and affection came in the eyes of bhishma dev and that is the mood uh, Uh, at the moment bhishma dev is exhibiting uh, while he is addressing uh, his his grandchildren who are sitting nearby him <clears throat> okay next one mata ji so you okay next protected. one you are protected now we will recite the verse please recite together with me so this is a very beautiful verse here there are some very important lessons are there that is why i have highlighted this verse please repeat with me अहो कष्टम अहो न्यायम अहो कष्टम अहो न्यायम यद्यूयम धर्म नंदनाह यद्यूयम धर्म नंदनाह जीवितुम नारहता लक्लिष्टम जीवितुम नथा नथा क्लिष्टम जीवितुम नारहता क्लिष्टम 
जीवतम नरथा पृष्ठम विप्रधर्मा चुताश्रया विप्रधर्मा चुताश्रया या विप्रधर्मा युताश्रया विप्रधर्मा चुताश्रया विप्रधर्मा चुताश्रया यस नाउ दिस वर्स सेइंग अहो कष्टम अहो न्यायम अहो कष्टम अहो अन्यायम ओ व्हाट अ टेरिबल सफरिंग ओ हाउ मच टेरिबल इनजस्टिस you good soul suffer for being the sons of religion personified yad yuyam dharma nandanah so because you were follower of dharma although besides being follower of dharma although you were follower of dharma you still had to go through so much of terrible suffering and so much of terrible injustices aho kashtam aho anyayam yad yuyam dharma nandanah and then jeevitum na nar hata klishtam you did not deserve to remain alive under those tribulations so you have undergone so much tribulations in your life that any normal human being would not have been alive because of those tribulations huh? but you were always protected you were always protected and why you were always protected and here is the key dear devotees here is the line which i wanted to share with you vipra dharma achyut ashraya you were always protected because you always took shelter of the vipra the dharma and achyuta vipra means the brahmanas dharma means religion or dharma and achyuta means lord krishna yet you were always protected by the brahmanas dharma and achyuta so this is what bhishma dev is saying to the pandavas that so much injustice so much terrible suffering you have undergone although you continue to follow the path of righteousness you continue to follow the path of dharma and you were able to do only that because you were protected by the brahmanas you were protected by dharma and you were protected by the lord himself so here prabhupada is mentioning formula for real protection please read <clears throat> formula for real protection as long as a person is fully in cooperation with the wishes of the lord guided by the bona fide brahman as and vaishnavas and strictly following religious principles one has no cause for despondency however trying the circumstances of life bisham dev as one of the authorities in the line wanted to impress this point upon the pandavas yeah so here we see uh, that vipra dharma achyut ashraya so vipra here means uh, vipra here means the, uh, devotees the vaishnavas dharma actually here means bhakti for us and achyuta here means the lord the bhagwan so if we are following bhakti the process if we are following uh, keeping the associations of the devotees bhakta and if we are actually uh, following the lord which is bhagwan bhakti bhakta and bhagwan then we will always be protected we will not have any difficulty in our life hmm. so that is what uh, lord uh, bhishma dev is trying to say to the pandavas <clears throat> okay let us see the next verse please uh, read mata ji yes prabhu ji as far as my daughter in law kunti is concerned upon the great general pandu's death she became a widow with many children and therefore she suffered greatly and when you were grown up she suffered a great deal also because of your actions yeah so uh, bishma dev is now bringing mother kunti also in the picture so pandavas were protected in the childhood Uh, because of the mother the mother took kunti devi took all the all the troubles she did not let the troubles come to the pandavas come to their children she took all the troubles but bishma dev is mentioning that look at kunti kunti suffered even more than you uh, her husband was gone uh, right at the very young age she became widow and she had many children three of her own and two with his co wife madri uh, she had five children many children and therefore she suffered greatly and 
not only she had their suffering in the in the in the beginning of her life for her own sufferings but she also suffered when you people suffered when you people uh, suffered that forest fire you 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 suffered that fire of lakshagraha you suffered that uh, poisoning of bhima by the kauravas and there were so many uh, list that we discussed in the previous class where kunti devi gives a long list of sufferings uh, she and her family had gone through so bishma devi is not trying to emphasize that your mother suffered even more then uh, then she then bishma dev comes to the the main point uh, and the and the main driving point which he uses to pacify yudhishthir maharaj so yudhishthir maharaj was very much lamenting that because of him all that massacre has happened and this is the verse 14th verse and from 14th verse 15th 16th 17th verse also which we will study in the next class here in the 14th verse bhishma dev is trying to give uh, yudhishthir maharaj the reason why actually he suffered now why what is the reason that he has to go through all these problems that is what this verse is trying to say so please recite with me mata ji Yes, सर्वं काल मन्ये सपालो यदे लोको सपालो यदे लोको वायुर्व घनावली वायुर्व घनावली ओके now we will first of all see the meaning of the second line because it makes the verse in a little more sequence series bhavatam cha yad apriyam apriyam means unwelcome bhavatam means you all bhavatam actually is referring in a very respectful sense or in a plural plural pronoun bhavatam aap like in hindi we call it aap and then in hindi we also call tu so bhavatam is more in a respectful sense aap bhavatam cha yad apriyam in my opinion whatever unwelcome has all been done to you uh, it is mainly because in my opinion it is all due to inevitable time sarvam kal kritam manye in my opinion it is all due to inevitable time so yudhishthir my dear son you think that all these things unwelcome has happened to you because of you because of your past deeds because of your karma or because of your bad decision no my dear son it is not because of this in my opinion all what has unwelcome has happened to you in your life it is all due to inevitable time inevitable time and i will explain you what does inevitable time means here in a short while and then bhishma dev says sapalo yad vashe loko time controls the world and its protectors sapal sapal means uh, Uh, who are rulers uh, sapal the protectors of the world yad vashe loko loko means the world time controls the world and its protectors vayur iva ghana valhi and just as the wind controls the clouds so if you see a cloud in the sky then the cloud does not have its independence the cloud does not can say that i want to be fixed at this position only if the wind blows the cloud has to move similarly if the time factor is strong if the time factor is strong then the living entity has to succumb to the will of the time factor it has to succumb to the will of the time factor and that is what bhishma dev is trying to make yudhishthir understand that it is only because of the time the inevitable time whatever has happened to you it is only because of that my dear grandchild and it is not please don't think it is because of your karma it is because of your any past misdeed it is because of your bad decision no it is only because of inevitable inevitable time now let us see what does inevitable time here actually means please read mata ji your unwelcome situation is due to time mm. everything therefore is controlled by the supreme uh, kal a forceful representative of the lord within the material world thus yudhishthira should not be sorry for the inconceivable action of time everyone has to bear the actions and reactions of time as long as 
one is within the conditions of the material world. Yudhishthira should not think mm -hmm. that he had committed sins in his previous birth and is suffering the consequences. Even the most pious has to suffer the condition of material nature. Yes. Now, please try to understand the difference here between the karmic reaction and the effect of time. So here you see, uh, thus, uh, everything therefore is controlled by supreme Kal. Kal here means time. A forceful representative of the Lord within the material world. So here, time is actually nothing but the energy of the Lord. It is the will of the Lord. So time in other words actually means the will of the Lord. So it was the will of the Lord that you had to go under these kind of sufferings. You had to undergo all these kind of tribulations. It was only, my dear Yudhishthir, the will of the Lord that you had to go through it. Now, this will of the Lord is different from the karmic reaction. Karmic reaction means that we have done some misdeeds in the past, previous life. And as a reaction to those misdeeds, we get some reaction in this life uh, and, and, and we suffer. But in the case of Pandavas, in the case of pure devotees, it is not, the suffering is not because of past misdeeds. Because if they are pure devotees, how can we past misdeeds behave on them or, or act upon them? Huh? It is only because of the powerful factor of time, huh? you had to go these sufferings. And what is powerful factor of time means? It is the will of the Lord. The Lord wanted you to go through these sufferings and that is why the Lord arranged it like this that you had to go through all this. So, my dear Yudhishthir, don't lament. Don't feel morose. It was actually the Lord's will that this all happened. And because it is the Lord's will, there is no question, there is no point of lamenting on all this. So, please pacify. Please be calm. Be, don't, don't, don't feel guilty about what all has happened. So, again, in Sarartha Darshani Tika, Vishwana Chukradi Thakur uh, gives a very succinct uh, explanation in his purport. Let us read it before signing off. Yes, Madhaji, please read. How representative of dharma have karmic reaction? Yudhishthira is well known as the direct incarnation of dharma. If dharma has prabhad karmas, prabhad karmas, how can we have any sense of dharma. Hmm. Therefore, the cause is not karma, but time, which cannot be countered and cannot be explained. explained. Yes. So here, here the, the discussion is, the explanation given is, uh, Yudhishthir is well known as Dharma Raj. He is the direct incarnation of dharma. And if we are if we are putting that label on Yudhishthir or if we are giving that Upadhi to Yudhishthir that he is Dharmaraj, he is the direct incarnation of Dharma, how can he not have any sense of Dharma? And how uh, uh, he would certainly have sense of Dharma. And if a person is following Dharma, he cannot have Karma. He cannot have Prarabdha Karma. He cannot be something like having Karma from the previous life because he is actually the direct incarnation of Dharma. So the direct incarnation of dharma is bound not to have any karmic reaction. There is no karmic reaction expected from a person who is dharmaraj. So therefore, the cause of unwelcome situation in the life of Yudhishthir Maharaj is not because of karma. It is only because of time. And what is time? Time is the forceful representative of the Lord. It is actually the will of the Lord, which cannot be countered and which cannot be explained. What is the will of the Lord? We cannot counter it. Neither we can explain because it is the will of the Lord. If the Lord wants something to happen in a certain way, it will happen in that way. We don't have any logic, any reason for that. So that is what the purport in the uh, uh, of verse number 14 actually mentions. Okay, with that, we sign off for today. All glory to Srimad Bhagavatam. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Now it's time for some discussion and some churning. Okay. Hope you found the class interesting enough. Thank you very much for your attention. Let me know if you have any comments. <clears throat> yeah.
हरे कृष्णा प्रभु जी यस प्रभु जी हरे कृष्णा वेरी नाइस क्लास एज यूजल आई हैव ओनली वन थिंग टू आस्क दैट इफ प्रारब्ध और योर प्रेजेंट कर्मा आर नॉट रिस्पांसिबल फॉर सच सिचुएशन सो व्हाट इज इट दैट टाइम comes in between why god I, wants us that way why because why lord time is given that important because lord is the master lord is the independent owner of this whole thing and the lord wants to do something then he uses his devotees he he takes he he actually uh, creates that stage where his devotees are actually involved and that gives him the opportunity to glorify the devotees and that also gives him the opportunity to execute his will through his devotees so that is what uh, that is what is meant by time factor and you will you will see in the in the uh, verses number 15 16 and 17 this is becoming more evident now in the explanation that it is actually the lord's will and you and i cannot understand and control lord's will that's how he will explain in the uh, no against uh, such a thing yeah how can you safeguard from the lord's will if the lord mare krishna rakhe ke rakhe krishna mare ke <laughs> but uh, bhakti and all these things are definitely steps towards uh, pleasing the lord so that he doesn't create such a situation yeah but they were so good but still they were they were yes. not to uh, do all that that is mainly to glorify their say so see he will the, the lord want to glorify the pandavas Uh, that see they they underwent so much tribulations but still they continue to do my bhakti so he wants to establish these role models also through these cases <clears throat> yeah so they are part of lord's leela like lord confused arjuna at the beginning of bhagavad gita lord confused yudhishthir maharaj uh, that is why he is known as adbhut karmana uh, that is why he is known as uh, uh, a very uh, special uh, the very special way of doing things adbhut karmana right okay so i hope you are enjoying these stories from shrimad bhagavatam so first canto is full of very rich purports by shila prabhupad it has all the leelas it has introduction to all the various uh, characters of shrimad bhagavatam vyas dev shukdev goswami parikshit maharaj bhishma dev Uh, narad muni and so on it has so beautiful prayers also kunti devi's prayers now you will see bishma dev prayers also so a very very nice uh, sweet devotional literature uh, shrimad bhagavat especially the first canto i hope yes. you are relishing it uh, very much uh, it is it is uh, it is entering in your heart uh, seamlessly without any trouble <laughs> and uh, yes. you are enjoying it okay okay then if there is no other comment or question or any discussion then we take your permission we continue to do our classes uh, on next sunday uh, next class i will now get into the mode of preparing some quiz because we have advanced quite a lot we have done 3 4 5th chapter of 6 7th 8th maybe at least six chapters three chapters more we should do the quiz so i will try to uh, start in the mode of preparing the quiz and let us see when it is get ready i will issue it to you a uh, little bit busy these days uh, because of some reasons uh, but uh, that is no excuse i will try to do it as soon as possible okay thank you very much thanks thank again hari krishna prabhu thank you prabhu hari krishna, krishna. krishna mata ji thank you thank you hari krishna hari krishna. Krishna. krishna thank you prabhu hari krishna hari krishna thank you mata ji thank you okay hari krishna prabhu ji hari krishna hari krishna prabhu ji thank you hari krishna mata ji thank you